Okay, guys, we are live! So for those listening at home, welcome to the Dungeon Musings YouTube channel. My name is Kevin Madison, and I'll be your friendly, grim, and perilous master today, because today we are kicking off a brand new campaign uh, playing a an old favorite of mine. Um, and this is going to be, we're playing in the newest edition, which we have played on the channel before, but it was quite some time ago, and it was only when the game was new, and that is Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition. And uh, with me today are the stars of our uh, Rough uh, Nights and Hard Days uh, campaign, named after the adventures from the module of the same name. And so obviously we are gonna be playing some of the mod some of the adventures that are published out of this adventure or the compendium. If you are intending on playing these, today's session will likely contain spoilers. So if you do wanna play any of the adventures out of this, come back after you've had a chance to play. Uh, if you don't care about that, or if you've already played through them, well, then let me introduce you to the stars of this campaign, and I'll ask them to tell us who they're playing today. First up, we've got Darren. Hello, yeah, down here I'm playing Salandra von Drakenberg, I think it is, or oh, Drakenberg. Drakenberg. Uh, yeah, uh, a noble uh, fighter class. Nice. And uh, joining Sally uh, is uh, John. Hey everyone, I am John, and I will change my screen name here in a second. I am playing Emrys Emberfell. He is a high elf merchant. He also appears to be part of the noble, noble class because his mom is a princess. <laughs> nice. I think every elf says that, don't they? So one of the things, we, we talked to, um, a little bit before we went live. Um, to give context for this, one of the things that we did last time we ran, uh, the last version of the, actually of, of a Warhammer Fantasy game we played was Warhammer Fantasy 2nd Edition. Uh, we played an adventure that was set in um, uh, in Breton. And I don't want to... Um, no, no, uh, Bretonia is where it was, not Breton. Um, and I, I don't want to uh, alarm you guys, but uh, that adventure ended with all of our heroes murdered by a Chaos Cultist. <laughs> So everybody died in that adventure. Uh, so I'm sure things will be much easier for you guys now. Uh, what we did last time was talk a little bit about uh, our familiarity with Warhammer too. Warhammer is one of those established, you know, um, uh, IPs. Um, I'll do mine last, but uh, Darren, what's your what's your exposure to and familiarity with the Warhammer fantasy setting or games? Uh, well, being in the UK. I grew up with Games Workshop, <laughs> uh, well, from a gaming point of view. So I played quite a few games of the tabletop with the little figures and many armies. So know a lot of the races um, and spent many, many hours setting up figures that then play for about 20 minutes and then put them all away again um, <laughs> with my brother. So a lot of that experience computer games i love the computer games the total war warhammer games it's one of the only games where i've actually got some books nice. <laughs> Role playing books like physical books that i can reference um so yeah i've got a sort of general understanding of the rough sort of world and on all the different races and stuff so uh it's probably the one i know not a lot about but more than any of the other games we play. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Have you played any of the versions of the fantasy role-playing game before? I played the first edition probably oof, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. maybe more. Uh, I can't remember when it came out. So back when I was at school, uh, and I've had a very, very quick uh, game session of sort of one session of the starter set, mm, running, okay. it, running it as a GM, but it was... Yeah, real, real uh, basic, like two hours sort of thing, and uh, just to see what people thought, and they liked it, but we just haven't had a chance to fit it into our schedule yet. Nice. Uh, and John, what, what about you? What's your level of familiarity with uh, Warhammer uh, Fantasy? Pretty much the exact opposite of him. Um, I was probably playing a War Machine game one time in a game shop, looking over, like, what's this game with figurines? Yeah. <laughs> Nice. Um, I've looked into it a little bit, but I've never actually bought any figures, looked into the setting much. So nice. I'm pretty green on this one. Well, that's great. I mean, that'll be a great way of um, someone who's seeing, you know, diving more into uh, pre-existing knowledge and one who's just coming at it fresh. For myself, um, Warhammer Fantasy RPG is one of the first role-playing games I owned. Uh, it, um, I played that and ran that a fair amount at the time. 
uh, to date myself for this, this is around the time when Rogue Trader originally came out, the original Warhammer thing. So we had adventures that were coming out in White Dwarf that we ran. Um, this, I started running before the um, Slaves to, Ka to uh, what is it called? Slaves to Chaos? Uh, whatever the two Chaos books, this was before those came out even. Um, I fell out of it for quite some time. Uh, and then I recently ran uh, Warhammer Fantasy 2nd Edition about two years ago. Well, no, was, I think it was pre-COVID, maybe? Two, within the last two, uh, two years or so, we played uh, a short campaign playing Warhammer Fantasy 2nd Edition, which is a really, really good edition. I One of our first uh, charity, uh, or not charity, the first gaming marathons was Warhammer Fantasy 3rd Edition. And then we briefly played a bit of Warhammer Fantasy 4th, but I wasn't familiar enough with the setting to really do it justice. And since that time, I've devoured a bunch of the... Uh, Gotrick and Felix novels and um, have read a lot more about the setting and I'm really excited to see fourth edition back at the table. Second edition is a terrific game as well too, but I am looking forward to seeing a couple things that they change in Warhammer Fantasy IV that I am looking forward to seeing how it plays out. Uh, the only version of the fantasy game we have not run on the channel yet is first edition. And if we do that, then I believe we will have a sweep as the first game where we've run every edition where there's more than three editions. So, I <laughs> look forward to the war story <laughs> where we're playing Warhammer Fantasy First Edition just to tick that box. Um, I mentioned at the outset we're going to be playing the uh, first adventure from the Rough Nights and Hard Days. It's a classic adventure called uh, Rough Night at Three Feathers. And we're going to get into that in a moment, but we're first going to talk about... Oh, and keen viewers will notice that uh, John and Darren are playing uh, two characters taken from the starter set. Um, we're kind of mixing and matching up stuff. You can get uh, uh, modules from Roll20 that have uh, the starter set and have Rough Night and, three, and uh, Hard Days, all the adventures as separate modules. I've kind of mashed the stuff up together because it was an easier way to kind of get characters and, and dive in. Um, but one of the things we want to talk about is, first is motivations and connections between the characters. The starter set comes with these handy little handout things, and then they have, uh, within each of the handouts for the characters, they have suggestions for you personalizing the motivation, personalizing the group tie, and personalizing secrets. Now, both of the players have selected secrets, which has given them some extra money and uh, made things uh, more problematic for them going forward. I'm sure that won't... Uh, cause any problems. Um, do you guys have a sense, have you are selected a motivation for each of your characters? Uh, I have for Amorous. Yeah. Um, he, uh, I think he's looking to find some new esoteric lore on uh, humans. So he's looking out for books. Okay. All right. So his motivation is to find more esoteric lore on humans. And then what about uh, Sally? Um, I'm going for vanquishing the corrupt. Mmm, very cool. Okay. So the reason that those are important is because motivation plays in... Let me write these down before I forget to. Sally. Is there a place to put them on a character sheet? Uh, uh, should be. It might uh, be on the top. Do they put it under ambitions? No. Let's see here. Uh, I'm just open up your character sheet. Um, mm, 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 mm. Not under combat. It's got ambitions, but not... Let's see here. Where? Okay, hold on. Oh, motivations under resilience. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, because uh, which is a, a clever way of reminding... It, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that it, it's uh, tied in. Uh, so, okay, uh, Vanquish the Corrupt for Sally and for Amorous Lore on Humans. All right, so... Uh, we talked a little bit about this beforehand, but we wanted to save the full discussion uh, of this for when we actually kicked off the game. There are four different narrative meta currencies in the game, uh, each of which um, refreshes at a different point. Um, many of them do things that we'll recognize from other RPGs we've played. So it, you know, it's really just a matter. You, I expect that you guys will remember that you're able to do stuff with the different narrative meta currencies, you'll just have to remember which one does what. Broadly speaking, they are organized into fate and fortune and resilience and resolve. Fortune is what you see in the blue bar on your character sheet. That is something that refreshes at the start of every session. So 
One of the ways of thinking about that, which I would encourage, is that you should not have any left by the end of the session. You've got those refreshing at the start of every session because the game intends that you're going to be able to take advantage of that. Spending fortune can be done to re-roll a failed test to add one success level to a test or to, at the start of a round, choose when you want to act in that initiative order. Uh, your fate is linked to the fortune. Fate is your save your bacon one. You do not get them back nearly as quickly. That's sort of like a reward for a big um, achievement in the adventure. Uh, so some big story moment that happens, whether that's resolving an adventure, whether that's defeating some, you know, a worshiper of chaos, someone who runs a, a cult to the, you know, ruinous powers or driving a dragon off or defeating a corrupt noble, whatever big story achievement, that's where you're going to be getting fate. And doesn't mean that you're necessarily refreshing it. You can keep getting fate on top of what you've got. Um, you can use it to die another day. Instead of dying, you're knocked out, left for dead, swept away and whatever else. Once it's spent, you do not refresh until you get new fate points. You can also uh, have it miss something. So again, said dragon shows up, tries to stomp on you. You're going to spend a fate point and it misses. Full stop. Okay. That is uh, your fortune refreshes automatically. Fate is related to what you achieve in the course of your character's lifespan. The resilience and resolve is more internal. So you can think of fate and fortune are the whims of things outside of your character's control. Fit resolve and resilience comes from within. Your resolve, it refreshes when you do something consistent with your motivation. You'll get resolve back. Resolve can be spent to make yourself immune to psychology. So that's like fear or being pinned or whatever, like things that would be affecting you negatively. You can spend it to ignore all critical modifiers for a round. Um, or you can spend it to remove a condition. Like a lot of modern games, this game has conditions that would be like, you know, fatigued or, you know, uh, scared or stunned or whatever. You can spend a resolve point to just get rid of that. And then finally, your resilience. Resilience has one of the most interesting ones in it. Um, one of them is to, you can spend a resilience point, and this is where you have to achieve something big in relation to your motivation in order to get it back. But one of them is to not gain mutations. Uh, the John, one of the overwhelming themes in the Warhammer world is the idea of there being chaos lurking at the edge of things. Magic involves that, and then they, they call them the four chaos gods are called the ruinous powers. And worshiping them, not only does it, uh, it's like embracing the idea or the medieval idea that spiritual corruption leads to physical corruption. So mutations and things like that are not uncommon in the world, but they are marks of chaos. And if you want to resist that, you can spend one resilience point to just not get it. It doesn't get rid of the corruption points, but it prevents you from gaining a mutation. Gotcha. Well, I was looking at one of the secrets uh, Amherst could have taken in. One involves getting corruption. I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Although that would be interesting. Uh, if you uh, want to play a spellcaster, you'll be getting corruption pretty quick, so don't you worry. Gotcha. And the other thing that I think is I, I mentioned is, is quite interesting is uh, rather than roll uh, for a test, you can just choose a number and you act as if you rolled that. And then you also get an example of um, you get it at a success level of one. So in an opposed test. So the reason that's important is for one, you get a chance to pick a crit. So you could pick a critical success for something, automatically potentially inflict a critical hit if you're in combat uh, or achieve some great success in, in outside of that. The other thing that's um, meaningful about it is that in combat, it means you can get a minimum success level of one because a melee combat is always contested. It's always an opposed role. I should say, I say opposed instead of contested. That's the nomenclature for this game. Um, they give an example in there. I mentioned before we went live that one of the things we're tracking is advantage. And uh, for those listening at home who may be familiar with fourth edition, we're using the the standard rules for advantage out of the core rule book. Um, there is a supplement called uh, Up in Arms that introduces a new mechanic. I really like the new mechanic and I wanna use it in the game, but we're gonna walk before we run and uh, get familiar with the uh, advantage mechanic as it is in the game and then we'll you know we'll uh, transition to the the new ones but the, the example they give there basically john if you for every round where there's a contested thing there's other factors that can add into advantage but you get one point of advantage 
Advantage grants you plus 10 on your chances. And remember, everything is contested. So once you get the tempo going in a fight, you can just see how things can steamroll pretty quickly. And remember, success level is what dictates damage. Each 10 gives effectively plus one damage. So whether you have control of the fight or the other side has control of the fight, things can get bad pretty quickly. And what the example they give there is like, imagine that there is a, um, you're fighting a bandit who has 10 advantage. They're just fucking dominating your allies and you're just like, how can we change the flow of this combat? What you can do in the, or at least what they do in the example is spend the resolve to, I will not fail on the next counterattack against this guy, you spend that, you get one success level. And the reason that matters, as soon as you don't gain advantage, you lose all advantage. So that is a way of suddenly transforming the tempo of what is happening. They lose all the advantage, you gain one point of advantage. You only have success level one, but it is a success. And because you won, even on a defense, that means you've got, you've won, you gain one point of advantage, they lose whatever advantage they have. So that is where that one is a really interesting one and uh, it can have a, uh, an, a, an impact outside of just like resisting stuff. So um, you're limited in what resilience you've got. Uh, so resilience and uh, resolve, they come back from motivation. Uh, resolve is regained whenever you act according to your motivation. During play, whenever you feel you've done this, you may ask the GM if you can recover one or more resolve points. Don't be shy in doing so because otherwise I'll, you know, I'll probably forget. <laughs> to be honest, there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on and never hurts to, to, to remind. Worst I can say is no. Well, actually, no. Worst I can say is no and Nurgle shows up and gives you the plague. But, uh, you know, probably that won't happen. Um, the... Other thing is resilience. Uh, whenever you um, you gain resilience point from acting an extreme something of extreme importance to your motivation, permanently nourishing your soul. So, yeah. So that is that. Um, the we talked a little bit before we went live about the game mechanics, but I think that the best way to learn is by doing. So I think we can. Unless you guys have any questions. Oh, one other thing I'll tell you, John, as well. The Warhammer Fantasy game has a many of the signature parts of other fantasy settings, like the Tolkien-esque, there are elves, high elves, wood elves, there's halflings, there's dwarves, there's uh, ogres, there's orcs and whatnot. They have a their own character. The setting is, you know, 30 plus years old. Uh, no, 86 was when the first one came out. So uh, that's, yeah, 30, 37-ish years old. So um, it has, uh, they have developed their own character and their own personality over over time. Uh, one of the um, I can't remember what's called the weird War of the Beards or the War of the Axes, and but anyway, there there was a war between elves and dwarves at one point, and it was fucking ugly, and it was really arguably the reason that the dwarven civilization has collapsed. Uh, the dwarves are a doomed people, and it's be partly because of that and. There's a great little bit, depending on who you ask, who's to blame, but like the animosity between elves and dwarves you see in Tolkien is taken to a much higher level. In, oh yeah, I got the hint of that when I was reading the race descriptions. I was like, ooh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the world is a very, the, the, the tagline for it was always a world of grim and perilous adventure. And it is, yeah, a lot of the, you know, um, it is a very different world from what we would expect from other fantasy settings, but everything just has that kind of grim patina. The other thing is the game has always in the setting has always had a sense of humor about it. So like, you know, orcs, even when they're writing out their, like phonetically their, their dialogue, they sound like fucking football hooligans, you know? And um, that's just part of the, you know, the, the silliness in it. Uh, you'll find like there are some names that are carryovers from the other that are just kind of like fun and playful. Um, that's part of the setting as well, is that it is extremely pitch dark and whatnot, but it is some elements of it are firmly tongue in cheek, uh, which makes the setting a lot of fun, you know? Uh, so that's the, uh, that's Warhammer. It's not ultra serious, dark and grim and gritty. It is definitely of the dark fantasy variety, but it is, um, it's a more lighthearted, I think, in its grimness. So, does that sound uh, uh, right for your experience with uh, the old world, uh, Darren? Well, playing against my brother on the tabletop with the orcs and goblins, 
you can't avoid the wackiness and the craziness and the <laughs> you know the snotling pump wagons and the fanatic <laughs> ball and chain characters <laughs> and you know it's just crazy one so. of the uh weapons <laughs> the um war machines that you can deploy as uh the what do you call it um as the orcs or, or goblins john is uh basically like a, a an orc or it's either a goblin or an orc who just holds on the end of a like a giant ball on the end of a chain and then just starts spinning around and then you hope that they wander into your enemies instead of wandering into your army but they can go into your army yeah the goblin fanatics they went 2d6 forward the first round and then after that it was random <laughs> which direction they go yeah, in so <laughs> so. <laughs> all right but anyway the um uh that is the uh setting and i guess for those listening at home too who may be more familiar i'll tell you i'm gonna screw up things about the setting i'm gonna screw up things about the uh the rules but we'll learn after each session we like to go back and, and re uh you know recheck so you know uh if it bothers you that uh, we will not uh, be trying to you know we won't be ro running this necessarily rules accurate I, I apologize for whatever frustration that will cause for you but that is just we'd rather get going and then learn as we go than uh, you know try and master it perfectly uh beforehand so with that guys let me show you where you are oh you know what why don't we do this why don't you guys give us a tell us a little bit about who you're playing because they do give some nice little summaries on those uh, character sheets too Yeah, what have we got here? Um, I think the who is is a good... Uh, there we go. See, uh, I can go first if you like. Yeah, yeah. See, uh, so Amorous, um, well, with all elves, it usually starts with who their parents are. Um, so his father is a merchant prince of... What is that? The Kothik, I think. Kothik, yeah. And uh, he wants Amorous to follow in his footsteps. But Amorous has absolutely no desire to do this at all. Um, because he is in love with humanity. In the short uh, two score years he's been in Altdorf, he's been both appealed and delighted by just how much it's changed. Um, Altdorf, bottom, John, is the capital of the Empire. Empire is like the largest political unit in the old world. So uh, he, he finds that he adores the chaotic and ever-shifting um, this of the Empire and uh, basically creates so much bewilderment that he's just uh, fascinated by it. Um, he made a deal last year with Sally, it looks like. Um, if she'd break him out of his father's compound, he'd help her in a job to steal something, like a brooch from his cousin. Um, so it looks like he's on the run. Um, and his father might view his friend as a thief and kidnapper, but is there anything wrong with that? Nah, he's uh, he just, <laughs> he's young, naive, and ferociously intelligent. Nice. So, oh, what about Sally? Uh, yep. Salandra is a rebellious daughter of the influential Duke von Drakenberg. Uh, she was raised in the military and now seeks her own fortune. She has a matter of fact, no nonsense attitude no nonsense attitude that disappears entirely when she drinks she's uh she's partial to a drink or two uh <laughs> reverts to the unruly soldier of her youth called sally by her friends she lets her and uh, uh Oh, she's, yeah, Sally by her friends that she lets know her by that name. Fearing betrayal, but bonds for life with those she befriends. She is known as being confident, capable, uh, but somewhat temperamental. Nice. Um, she has a strong sense of right and wrong and works hard to do what she feels is the right thing. And when it comes to... Uh, Amorous there. Um, she feels she's got a personal responsibility for Amorous's safety because nice. of what John said there, obviously, with the job they did. Yeah. So, so she's um, looking out for him. There's one other thing that I wanted to mention because it's not something that comes up uh, as expressly in other games. It is your your uh, status. Um, so there is gold, silver, and uh, brass, I think. Yep. Yeah, uh, if you are from a higher status, like like in you know medieval Europe, um, nobility and your station has can have a big impact. If you are from a higher 
uh, I think it's a higher status is what of those tiers you're in and I think it's station is what number it is within it um, so like Solyndra is gold one so she is nobility but she's the very bottom rank of nobility uh, anybody with any kind of significant position is going to have a step over her. Uh, you are silver, Amorous, uh, which means that you are from a lower station than what Sally is, but from the average folk, uh, you'll be one step above them. And within silver, you're five. So you're hmm. fairly high up within the uh, uh, within that, um, that sort of stratus of uh, society. The reason that matters is because you, you get modifiers for intimidating, for charming and whatnot, there is a like air of nobility that can happen. Um, but it also means that when you're doing certain things like charming or trying to small talk or whatnot, if you're doing it outside of your status, outside of your class, then it will be challenging for you. You know, it's a proverbial like, you know, Steve Buscemi at high school, hello fellow kids kind of thing. You're, you just don't have the frame of reference, you're out of place in those things, and the game reflects that. So there are advantages that come from that and disadvantages that come from that. And um, uh, yeah, it's it's a neat thing that doesn't come up in a, a lot of fantasy games that is very much a part of this one. So, all right. So then, guys, let me show you where our adventure will be starting. Let me grab your tokens here. So I have them. There we go. And, and, and. Yes, and for those listening at home, I apologize. We were kind of realized after the fact that we didn't have a proper map of the uh, Empire. Let me, oh, don't move your screens, guys. I'll move this thing up. There we go. All right. So this is the region around Altdorf, the capital of the Empire. The Empire is sort of a ersatz version of the Holy Roman Empire uh, from our world, though um, it is definitely a, that you use as a starting point of understanding it is its own kind of setting uh this here i believe is the river reich which uh leads up and then matches or meets up with another one of the things i have a really great uh fully detailed map of the empire that's actually on the inside of the cover of the most recent editions uh which i'll load between now and next session Altdorf is the uh, capital. Uh, each of the different areas here are some of the um, the different uh, principalities that make up the um, the empire. The empire, like the Holy Roman Empire, is uh, ruled by uh, a emperor, but they are selected by the elector counts by each. So again, very much like the you know Holy Roman Empire. Our campaign will start with you guys moving through the Grissenwald here. Uh, you have been in Nuln before, but you are happen to be on the road traveling through the Grissenwald, and I think you've decided that... Let me tell you what the core rulebook tells us about that forest. It's the uh, old world, so I'm sure it's you know always going to be something safe and happy, dappled with light, certainly not full of, you know, corrupted beast men, things like that. Let's see. We have the settlements, bastions and fortresses. Not I thought I thought I saw in here. Hmm. I thought I saw a description of some of the geographic features, not just the cities. I could be wrong. There's the politics, there's the history. Here it is. Grim Dark Forest. Here we go, guys. The Grissenwald. The southeasternmost end of the Reichwald branches southward along the Stirland border and thins out as it heads upriver towards the city-state of Nuln. Uh, the wi this wide section of the forest is known locally as the Grissenwald, a tight woodland packed with distorted trees and twisted undergrowth, the depths of which are said to be swarming with beastmen, witches, and tribes of feral mutants. Because of this, most local woodsmen travel in groups and seldom stay outside come nightfall. And it's commonplace to find fluttering bills posted on roadside trees offering rewards for the retrieval of lost family and friends from the bowels of the forest. I think 
With that in mind, you may understand why you guys, when you were traveling on the road, decided to take a turn off and you can picture yourselves walking down a narrow uh, wagon path uh, that is leading you towards uh, a waiting inn, the Three Feathers. Three Feathers is also located on the Reich itself, the Reich River. And the reason that's important is because barge traffic and barge travel is a very popular way of getting around the empire. And perhaps rather than risking hoofing it through the Grissenwald, it might be wiser to just get onto a barge, follow the Reich to wherever you want to go. I think you guys may be heading to Kemperbad, uh, right up here. Where you guys are currently, I think is uh, east of Stumengen. Let me double check that. Unfortunately, the, uh, there is a campaign map that's in the book, but it has everything marked on it. Yeah, you guys are about, the three feathers will be about here. Near this crook in the Reich. I don't think you have a job necessarily. You're not, you're not on, um, you know, uh, on the way towards doing something. You were just happen to be traveling along. So I'm wondering me... if we could uh, flavor it like we're dodging the most recent attempts for my father to find us and get me back in his. Yeah, maybe that's the reason you're traveling through the the Grissenwald, right? Like that's that's a good way of losing your pursuers is go a place that they are unlikely to want to go to, right? Yeah. Seeing if there are. Uh... All right, so I was just seeing if... Oh, you know what? I've got here, guys. Hold up. Uh, so they've... Roll20, these modules are really great. The only thing I wish they would stop fucking doing is when they set one up, they set it so it fills up the whole screen. So it's just it's a pain in the ass to try and display some of this stuff if you want to use it just as a way for players to see things. But whatever. I, mean, I clearly need real problems in my life if this is the extent of the... Uh, you know, problem I've got. Here we go. There we are. Okay, we'll do that. But well, fortunately, your friendly, grim, and perilous game master did think ahead and loaded a whole bunch of images. Let me show you what the three feathers will be like, which is going to be not uncommon for many uh, roadside inns. Here we go. And this is. Oh, uh, I should say as well, guys. The Three Feathers Adventure, Rough Night at Three Feathers. This is one of the few adventures that uh, can share with many other, you know, like The Haunting is an adventure from Call of Cthulhu. Um, it is an adventure that has been in every edition of the game. I think Tomb of Horrors is the one for D&D that has been in first, second, third, fourth, fifth. This is The Three Feathers. And Three Feathers is typical for roadside inns. And I believe I could bring it to, yeah, very cool illustration uh, that will show you what to expect as you're walking up towards it. You said it's right on the river. You meant right on the river. It is right on the river, yeah. And because the forest is full, what I guess, uh, John, what beastmen are is a specific corrupted spawn of chaos. They are chaos personified. They have some, uh, the most common one you see are like beast heads uh, or uh, oh, goat head kind of things. It's the one that you see most in, in um, Warhammer uh, like uh, art or miniatures or whatnot, but they are creatures of chaos so they can have all sorts of things. A lot of things like minotaurs or you know centaurs stuff like that. They're not necessarily centaurs, but uh, minotaurs. And there's a thing called a dragon ogre, which is like a combination of ogre and dragon as a centaur. Um, all creatures of chaos, and they can have. You might see uh, a beast man who looks mostly like a big muscular bestial man with a goat's head, but they also might have a tentacle for an arm, or they might have a second head growing out of their head, uh, or all sorts of you know bizarre things. They are different from just generic mutants. Beast men are a separate species, but all are uh, uh, the corrupted spawn of chaos and in service to the ruinous powers. Gotcha. I guess people drive them out quite quickly if, <laughs> if they, they can. see them. They also Jeez. breed incredibly quickly. Jeez. So it's just a constant uh, struggle against this. But this is what you are seeing as you're making your way up towards Three Feathers. I have 
Guys, a little gift for you. Some block text. So, it has been a long day of travel. The sun is just beginning to go down as you come upon an inn. It's summertime, too. As you draw closer, you notice that the place is unusually busy. There's a large coach pulled up outside, and lackeys are busying themselves with various trunks and chests as liveried men-at-arms look on. And inside, once you step inside, let me bring you in. Now I can, oh, let me grab your tokens. Bring it inside. Oop, 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 there we go. I'm going to make sure you both have vision. Oop, that's what I want to do. Oh, you do not. Okay, there we go. An amorous. Oh, you know what we'll do, guys? Before we get in, let's just quickly go through your character's ability so we we're all know what they what they have. Because you guys have a number of specific advantages and such that um, you do it. And one of the important things that is, uh, as far as the internet tells me, that is often missed. There is a little paragraph at one point in the core rulebook where it reminds you that certain talents will add plus one to success level for your uh for your certain skills and you can get more than one level it's one of the ways where certain characters can really excel it shows how you're you get more expertise as opposed to that it's often it's apparently the most commonly overlooked rule in the game so it's worth going into it and uh and making sure we remember what everyone can do so let's start because um, i got you guys on left to right here let's take a look at sally so I'm really just interested in what your... Should we uh, should we roll all for our like secret shilling stuff that we did? Oh yeah, yeah, if you go, go ahead and roll that. I'm gonna take a look at where, here are your talents, here we go. Now your talents, if what is, we, they are set up so you can display them in chat as well by hitting on the little thing there, so like there's... Yeah. Yep. Uh, I notice that not all of them are set up perfectly, but what you can do is find that in the compendium and cut and paste it into the thing if you'd like. So yeah, do since... That's a human thing, I believe. Oh, nice. So if, 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 if a human dies, they get half of their experience to their next character because yeah. they're fated to be doomed <laughs> at and some point. Yeah. Moor is one of the gods, the not the ruinous powers. Moor is the god of death. And um, so that you're brought before the doomsayer and you learned your dooming. Has Sally ever talked to anyone about what her dooming was? Um, maybe, maybe um, a brother's, uh, so family only. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see your next up. Savvy is just a background one. You've gained plus five to your intelligence. Yep. Luck, uh, again, a luck background is, one. Yep. Double blood. Um. Yeah, this is an interesting one. So assuming you're dressed uh, appropriately, you're always considered to have higher status than others unless they have the noble blood talent. So if someone else is in the gold tier, but does not have this, you still will count as a higher level, meaning plus 10 to intimidation, plus 10 to charm and, and those kind of things. Um, yep. You were able to read and write. Where you're born again, another background one. And yep. these are all background ones for you. So you really don't have to track yeah. anything. That's pretty good. And resilient, yeah. Okay. And then for Amaris. Let's see. Here. See, yeah. Uh, I, I can click on the ones that yeah, are yeah, not sure. go ahead, background. Go, 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 uh, well, let's click them on all of them. Let's just see what all of them do. Okay. So we got Blather. Yeah. Um, you may use your charm uh, as an opposed charm and intelligence check uh success gives your opponent the stunned condition you just bullshit them into, <laughs> into being stunned mm -hmm. that's terrific we uh, got briber hold on i'm just gonna see what what it says here the you may blather once per scene um that's awesome uh reduce the base cost of any bribe by 10 percent. that's pretty good got uh deal maker okay uh, oh, nice. When you use a haggle skill, you reduce the price by an extra 10%. That's pretty good. There's full rules for haggling the, the, down the prices of stuff in uh, in the rule book, core rule book. And we got Savvy. Okay. Oh, we also get you yeah, here. I'm just going to make sure we hit the other. So night vision, 20 yards. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and that's uh, more like low light vision in the others. Yeah, perfect. Oh, Makes gotcha. sense. I'll let you do that. And... 
uh, you may... Okay, so you may make... Test. Now, hold on. Does it... Does Acute Sense also grant, grant you a plus one to... It's not listed here, but I don't know. Mm -mm -mm. Here we go. Acute Sense. No, I was wondering whether it added to success levels with perception, but it does not. Okay, and then, uh, so, did we do savvy? Yeah, that's a background one. Six cents. Yeah. Let's see here. Ooh. Secret intuition check. So what is your intuition? Yes. Uh, I... 56. That would be one of our basic, yeah. Yeah, okay. And read, write. So you're able to read and write. All right, so... Amorous can have a sense of when things are just hinky. Yeah, and uh, see, I can ignore surprise if I pass an intuition test. So yeah. hopefully nothing gets a jump on us. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> no, I know I know how you play. <laughs> I'm going to need that. <laughs> okay. So then, guys, um, let me go back to the adventure. So I'm going to make sure you got your... Hey, you got your vision on. Good stuff. If, if I was making amorous, I might have got uh, acute senses smell just for like smelling the old vellum, seeing where it's been, just to make it interesting. But I don't. I think that that one might have been one of the ones that you had. You, like you were specifically limited to what you could oh. pick for your um, uh, for your ancestry. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, when you make a character, there's um, your there's different factors that play into the. Uh, character creation. Um, one of them is your species or ancestry. There we go. Now, is this in... Hold on. Why is that so dark? Is it in... It's here. Dynamic lighting. Turned on. Daylight mode. And... You know, if I had one... You know, the world point does some really great stuff. The restricting movement toggle for dynamic lighting should really be on the um, the the dynamic lighting tab. So let's see here. Yeah, that's you outside. All right. So what I want you to picture is if you look at the three feathers. In particular, notice that there is the full wall out front there, right? The wall runs around the yard and right down to the edge of the Reich River. But the front facing wall, the Three Feathers itself, is what serves as the, the first barrier. There isn't a wall around it and there's a separate structure. I want you to picture that as you step inside here. I'm just going to resize you guys to make you a little... There we go. Then I'll return to our block text here. And I may be dropping some other NPCs down here with some names. So this is what you walk into. Inside, servants are hurrying to and fro, and the innkeeper is engrossed in conversation with a scribe who carries a visibly bulging purse. It's a full 10 minutes. Oh, did we lose you, John? Yeah, somehow zooming out with my mouse hit me in the, the back. Or oh, yeah, yeah, because it's... I'm back. Okay, it, uh, this roll 20 in, in Firefox it does something funny. I, I routinely uh, accidentally do that. I'm going to put, um, just for ease of reference, uh, there are some, uh, let me see here, move this to the map layer. Okay, and then we'll go to the map layer and we'll send to back. You guys see the arrows and the uh, letters on the different tables? Yes. That will just be for ease of reference. I think it'll just be easier for you guys to see those things when you, when you do. Smell as you walk in here too. Food is cooking. You've been walking through the forest, and the forest, it doesn't have a, um, it has a, like, wet stink to it, as if, like, it has rained recently. So, stepping in here and having this smell of smoke and food and people is, uh, is quite something. Uh, the innkeeper, I believe I have a couple of handouts. Uh, I'm 
because there are there's a lot of role playing in this one i am giving you guys a bunch of handouts to try and keep track of stuff so you can hopefully put faces in it to the pretend names we're going to be using oops And here is what you can picture for the staff. And the innkeeper. The innkeeper, I believe, is that lovely uh, woman in the front. And for the, let's see here, servants. Do I have an illustration? For them, I think I do. that in too. Yep, here we go. The servants of nobility. Over here, uh, looking at this from an American point of view, I'm like, most of these guys are not that good looking. <laughs> <laughs> this is the old world. They're not. I know. <laughs> this, is this is not, great. you know. Yeah, it is a very different setting. Um, yeah. And then what you can also see in here too, which is perhaps not surprising, uh, are some travelers. Now you will have a moment to look around and study. I'm gonna put, to, I have tokens for some of the other folks as well which I'll place to give you an idea of where other individuals are. And I'm looking for, here we go. The true workhorses of the road. The coachman and the boatman. So at the three feathers is where both meet. Those who have braved the roads and those who brave the waterways. There are road wardens and there are river wardens who try and keep things safe, but the Empire is a dangerous place in the uh, areas between. Now, what is um, immediately uh, um, obvious is there's two things that stand out. Um, one is there is a great big guy wearing arm or bare chested who is sitting at table B. He looks like this. He stands out because uh, almost immediately after you walk in, um, you've witnessed him slam someone's arm onto the table from a uh, successful, or at least he successful, arm wrestling competition. And he kind of <laughs> stands up, his you know impressive physique displayed and people all cheering. There's some cursing in the background because clearly people have been betting on this. But one of the uh, guards, I guess, or someone who was traveling on here is rubbing their arm for where this big fellow has... Uh, defeated them. Now let me find where he is. Um, do I have a token? Oh, I do not have a token for him, but let me place, I have an illustration for him. I can resize it. There we go. This is where he sits. The other thing that stands out to you, if you're you know, because this is, it's its not unusual for nobility to be traveling on the road, and they certainly travel with this many uh, people hustling and bustling around, bringing all their gear in every time they arrive at a place. Um, and obviously, they're the ones who the landlords of such establishments or the proprietors of such establishments will want to fawn their attention on before they come to other lowly travelers. Um, what you also see is sitting... 
Oh, sorry, the um, arm wrestler, he's at table A. So to your right, near where the stairs are as you come in. The second thing that stands out to you, I have, unfortunately, she, uh, her illustration is in mixed with another one. So you can ignore the other one for the time being. But let me show you who else you see here. That is, where is she? Where is she? Oh, yeah. Should I get her name right? Yeah. So seated at that table, at that uh, B, is a little halfling on the left there. She's a stack of cards in her hand, and the deft and uh, careful way that she is shuffling them tells you this is a card player, a gambler, likely of some kind. Um, but what is of particular interest to you is, and let me put a, do I have a token for her? Where is she? I do, yes I do, here we go. So she is right here. Let me just give you, I think I can set the name out. Yeah, there go. You guys can see her name there now? Yes. Okay. Yep. And standing next to her is something quite impressive. Uh, not something, someone. Let me show you what that looks like. What I'll do is I, I didn't realize I'd be doling out quite so many tokens. Uh, I'll do, I'll load the rest of these. Uh, between now and next session, so we won't, you guys won't be waiting for me to load this shit in. This is who is standing next to her. You need not make any rolls to realize this is one of the nobles of the Empire. So, uh, Sally, you recognize your, your kind. And I think what you can do is, I, I don't believe that either of you have lore empire, do you? Just Reichland. Go ahead, Yeah, you can give us a lore Reichland roll at plus 20, Sally. Okay. Apparently, I don't have any lore skills. Hmm. Critical ah. failure. <laughs> now, you can spend a fortune point to avoid that if you want. You don't definitely would want to call it by the wrong name. <laughs> Am I, am I actually approaching her, am I? Uh, no, no, you're just seeing her. I just want to see there may be something you might know. Um, Okay, I'm going to use a... Can you use a fortune on a critical failure? I think so. As far as yeah. I, I don't remember seeing any rules. There's uh, okay. only um, Savage Worlds. For sure, you can't uh, re-roll, but... Okay, well, I'm going to give her another go. Okay. Let's see here. 57, success, nice. So, with uh, two degrees of success, too. What you can tell is, you recognize for one thing, the heraldry. This is a, someone of the Ambostein, or Ambostein, I guess. The Ambostein noble family. And in fact, the, from the heraldry that you can see on her, this is someone um, of likely some importance. Not someone who would be a countess of some kind necessarily, but someone of some importance. And she seems to have come to some kind of agreement with the um, with this little card playing halfling woman because she shakes her hand and then here we go. There she is. And for those listening at home, I'm going to zoom in on uh, our map here so we can, you can have a better idea of who's in the room here. There we go. This is a bottle episode uh, for the game. So everything's going to happen in one room. <laughs> so she shakes uh, Sibling's hand, and then she... Let me turn this off here. 
out of there. There you go. And then she turns and flanked by the, what do you call it? Uh, by uh, servants is making her way over here and then up the stairs. When you see her go, there's something about the, hmm. There's something about the thing that seems familiar, Sally, and I'll tell you more in just a moment. But then you finally hear that lady, the uh, hefty lady who had been talking to the servant with the big coin purse who has accompanied this noble lady up the stairs. She turns and heads over and uh, she says, <laughs> welcome, welcome. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. We have a distinguished guest tonight. The Graven Maria Ulrika von Liebowitz of Amblestein, no less. And Sally, that clicks so you're like, right, that's, that's the reason that's of importance to you. The uh, Graven is a servant of Countess Emmanuel. Uh, Countess Emmanuel is the Graven's aunt. This is the niece of Countess Emmanuel von Liebwitz of Nuln, the place you just left. Countess Emmanuel has legendary parties. A unbelievably not notorious debauch. She, um, in particular, during Black Powder Week, which is a winter-long winter festival, week-long winter festival held in Nuln, um, they are just um, absolute legendary events. And Amaris, I think because of your obsession with uh, humanity, you can actually just give us a flat intelligence check. Let's see if you happen to know anything more about the Countess Emmanuel or the Graven. Uh, average difficulty? Uh, average difficulty, yeah, no modifier. Target, any target number? Uh, no target number, no. Okay. <laughs> As a marginal failure, uh, you want to uh, give us a... You want to spend a fortune to re-roll that? Oh, you only have one as an elf, don't you? Yeah, I'm not keen on... Uh, you know, I've been fascinated with humans, but it seems like my friend knows quite a bit about her, so... Okay. So, yeah. So, uh, well, and Sally hasn't said anything as of yet, but it, you just have put two and two together, like, oh, and shoot. Like, she's dressed almost as nice as my friend, so it's, uh, hmm. Yeah. Um... Well, I mean, uh, Sally certainly doesn't necessarily wear her station. Uh, thinks the giant plate, uh, you know, plate mail breastplate might say otherwise. Uh, so returning to your conversation with this, I hardly know whether I'm coming or going right now. <laughs> now then, uh, do you wish a room? What am I saying? Of course you wish a room. Again, excuse me. I'll only be a moment. Uh, and then sort of goes off because she sees that the merchants are wanting something or the, uh, the merchant, the... Uh, uh, servants of the of the graph, um, you seem to be someone more in this person's mind at that present to gush over having such a distinguished guest more so than being guest yourself. <laughs> so you have a moment amongst yourselves, and what you can see that there is definitely money changing hands at um, the big guy's table, and the way he talks about himself in the third person, you can uh, quite easily pick up that this apparently is Bruno. Who will challenge Bruno next? Um, <laughs> and some other poor sod is going to sit down and he sits down, you know, muscles rippling. He gets ready to arm wrestle with the next uh, contestant. Uh, the rest of the inn is, is um, you know, not full to, to bursting yet, but there's a lot of people in here and there are, um, what do you call it? Uh, there are... Uh, uh, travelers, so, you know, like road uh, travelers, there are clearly bar, you know, the captains of barges, uh, coachmen sitting at the bar, sitting at some of the other tables. Um, the grinning halfling seems to be welcoming people to someone else has asked if they can play with her now that the graven has left. She gestures and, you know, they're sitting down. So there are um, at least two different pub games that you guys can potentially involve, indulge yourself in to pass the time. Arm wrestling with Bruno seems to be one and playing a game of, is it, um, oh, she's playing Scarlet Empress, a uh, two round game of cards that, uh, and there definitely seems to be coins that are changing hands here. So 
Am Amorous glances over to Bruno and he just like rubs his like wrist like no that's not for me but he's he's looking at the the, the card game as with some minor interest uh, he has some shillings burning a hole in his pocket okay and after let's see here uh she finishes talking to the other guest she returns to you uh, it's about 10 minutes i am so sorry this really is quite a mad evening now you would like a room i have one available and there is a single room uh that will have let's see here It will be room four that she can offer you, if you like. Uh, single rooms are... Ba, 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 ba. Let's see here. Oh, no, hold on. You, you can either have a double room, which will have uh, two beds in it, uh, or you can have a single room with a single bed in it and you guys can feel free to um to take to separate things uh she only has one of each available and the cost is going to be where is it where is it, where is it? here we go cost for a single room will be 10 shillings uh, per night a double room costs 15 shillings you can also alternatively near the back you see the door open and then close uh there is a dormitory back here where kind of like the more common folk uh, would uh, sleep. It's there's a bunch of beds in there, but it's all a big shared room. So, and it's it's right next to the um, the main room. So you know it'll be kind of noisy. The, but the dormitory only costs you one shilling. All prices include supper and breakfast. And it is possible to cram one extra person into a single or double room, but they will have to sleep on the floor, and they'll pay a surcharge equal to half the cost of the room. So really. You could choose to have either a double room uh, that's going to cost you 15 shilling or you're going to pay for a single room to cram both of you in it, which will cost you 15 shilling. What do you guys wish to do? Mm. <laughs> Amber's mumbled something about things. Oh, sorry, so me, there are more than one single room. So if you both want to have a separate single room, you can do that as well. Amber's just... Uh, Highway robbery is what that is, he thinks to himself. <clears throat> um, he looks over at Sally, he's like, it's cheaper to share a room or we sleep with the uh, the common folk. <laughs> the common folk. <laughs> I think not. Um, but Sally is aware that she hasn't got a lot of money. Uh, but yeah. You know what are the ways to make that's money, not guys? On the table. I, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, think uh, let's let's see how our uh, evening goes. Yeah, Emma said. He looks at Sally and says, "That how, how many shillings you got on you? I got seventeen. I could yes. cover the cost of the room, but uh, maybe we can make some money uh, gambling." Well, let's do this. Let's uh, let's get that that double room, and then um, we'll use the rest of our money to see how our evening proceeds. And maybe we can upgrade okay. at a later time. So, so if you are booking when the landlady returns, uh, if you're choosing to book a... Is that acceptable to you, Amaris? Yes. Just, are we splitting the cost? Am I paying most of it, Sally? Well, if you, uh, if you would be uh, up for paying for the room, then uh, I'll pay for the entertainment this evening, shall we say. So Emmers reaches in the pocket. He's got two shillings. He rubs together and just pockets it, and then orders the uh, the room with the other fifteen. It's like, okay. Uh, All right. So the then, already. Yeah, these are. Um, it, it, it was not uh, unheard of to have uh, Warhammer heroes sleeping in an alleyway or sleeping in a sty because they cannot afford proper. Not tonight. <laughs> So the, I got this fine silk robe and nah. Mm -mm. Got to keep up uh, appearances, I suppose. So, all right. So with that, uh, you are given the keys to room number eight, uh, which will be on the second floor. And let me see here. I can show you what your room looks like, guys. Happens me, to be my favorite number. Let me bring you over here to the hallway. So when it's you come... 
it have two beds in it? Uh, it has two beds in it. Yeah, let's see here. Eight. Oh, no, it has a double bed. Oh. So this is where you would come up the stairs. Um, oh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. There are rooms that have double beds. Let me make sure I've got that right. I might be listing that incorrectly. Here we go. Um, if the characters book a double room, you'll be given room eight. So yeah, uh, I think it's just a, it's an error in the in the art order. Uh, gotcha. So there should be two beds in there, but eight is right over here, guys. Let me open up the door to your room. I, this is a really well done map for Roll20. I was grouching about having it set up, but they've got windows set up on here. They've got doors on here. It's fucking great. Let me open the door. Cool. I was going to say, in, in the UK, a double room is normally a double bed. A twin room is normally two seats. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there aren't twin rooms. Potentially. The, the thing is, there are rooms that have two beds in them, though. Oh, you know what? Yeah, you normally call that a twin. Yeah, I think it's a double bed. I think you're right, Darren. That that. Uh, so if you step in, you guys can go ahead and move yourselves inside. This is what you'll be in for tonight. Now, That's and this is, a, is fairly typical of uh, coach inns in uh, the old world. It's Coaching weird, inns. The, uh... I'm guessing the map on roll 20 doesn't map match the map we have in our handout. Um, it, let me see here. Ro roommate on our handouts like up here in the corner. Oh, yeah. It is different. Let's see. Oh, uh, let me see here. Yeah, it's room yeah it is. Oh, it's weird. That's really, you know what? I mean, they may change things from the PDF then. I can't tell you this, the, the map that you're looking at for, this is the, like, this, that's the three feathers from, you know, that's the map that's actually I've seen in older editions of the game. Ah. Yeah, yeah, so it could very well be... Oh, yeah, 8 is listed um, elsewhere on here. That's interesting. 9, 8... Huh. Yeah, so so those will not track necessarily. But I can show you on... Well, 20... Let me... Yeah, they probably just changed the numbering to match conventional numbering because 5, 8, 6, 7 instead of... Yeah. Why not? 5, 7. Okay. So you survey the... Um, the room you have for the evening and then unless there's anything else you guys wish to do you're not going to want to spend the evening in the in this place nah nah okay so Stay. for this adventure and actually for all the adventures in this particular uh series of adventures timing is kind of everything so we're going to be keeping track of time uh, throughout this as you bring yourself back down into the common room here it is nine o'clock so with you making your way into the common room uh why don't we you know what guys so we are at our, our mid-session right now why don't we take our mid-session break right now uh refresh our beverages come back and then we'll see how you're going to choose to spend your evening at the three feathers okay so for those listening at home we'll be back momentarily
All right. So then, guys, let's um, talk about what you guys have. What you guys have talked about. So you get up there. You've got whatever trappings are in your character sheet. Um, what are you guys thinking of doing to spend, you know, the evening to try and are you trying to make up some of the uh, coin that you spent here or? Yeah, I mean, when we put our our belongings in the room, yeah. uh, little bits that we've got, um, I shall hand over like seven silver to Amrus and uh, keep the other sort of seven to myself and for sort of spending money this evening. Um, I think I will force myself to make a call check at this point. <laughs> The drawer of the bar is becoming a little bit too much. Yeah. So I'm gonna. Uh, so is is an average check. Average is plus twenty. It's always 20. plus twenty, isn't yeah. it? So unless otherwise. We're, unless we're, yeah, we're, otherwise, yeah. The, the game is a lot more like uh, in combat. Uh, things are I think as challenging as the plus zero. Um, yeah. The game more so. This started with the fantasy flight games, but they've moved a little more towards like you be a little more competent. If Warhammer Fantasy first, like your chances of success with shit was normally like thirty five percent, you know, for something you're good at. All right, okay. so close, so yeah, close. I'm, I'm going straight to the bar. Outstanding. Uh, <laughs> Get a so, drink. So let's see here. Oh, your so your grog is going to be. Let's see here. Because uh, money is worth tracking this because pint of ale will be uh, three pennies. It's 12 pennies per shilling, 20 shillings per crown. So it'll be three pennies for this, uh, for your pint of ale. And then there is a skill called consume alcohol that has been in the game since the very start. Every alcoholic, uh, after each alcoholic drink, make a consume alcohol test modified by the strength of the drink. <laughs> um, oh, yes. I have consumed alcohol as well, but it's, uh, Everyone, it's, it's not that high. Basic it's skill. Basic, yeah. Yeah. So then if you're, are you buying for one one for each of you? I'll, I'll get two drinks. So I'm going to... She's telling herself she's buying it for me, but she's drinking both of those. Yeah. Listen, you don't want to drink I mean, alone. I'll, yeah. I'll bring them over if Amaris doesn't <laughs> like notice that I brought them over. She'll probably just drink them both. But, okay. Um, um, what is the strength? What do I need to do? Uh, on the for trip? this, this is, I, I think, let me see here. Oh, that's a stinking drunk thing. Um, what if it's under? I think let's make it average. This is not super strong stuff. It doesn't benefit them okay. to get people hammered in the middle of nowhere. So let's give us okay. a uh, average consume alcohol test for both of you, please. Oh, I'm not drinking it. You're not drinking it? Nope. Okay. Okay. I, I, I would probably pretty much nick that first one at the bar and just bring the other one over. Okay. Not until uh, I got a little bit more shillings a, in my pocket. It was a long wait at a bar. But, uh, <laughs> and I just start drinking the second one. <laughs> Outstanding. Yeah, I, I imagine that. It's a thirsty work. Okay. So you're good. That first one is sitting fine, Sally. You're uh, you're good to, to uh, carry on with what you want to do. So let's talk about what you are what do you guys want to do with uh, your evening? At least uh, right now, nine bells. Bruno uh, seems to be, if you sort of, you know, just walk over and look, hmm, let's see what both of them are up to. Looks like um, you can get in for a uh, stake with the, uh, uh, for a game of Scarlet Empress, which will use gambling uh, at one shilling to get in on the game. The arm wrestling, uh, is stakes of two shillings. Now, the way that arm wrestling works is it is a contested... Let's see here. Here we go. Um, there's like five pages of pub games in the in the back of the swing, so there's like different ones you can introduce to your game. I fucking love it. Arm wrestling is an extended opposed challenging to plus zero strength test. Um, and you add your strength bonus to the success level each round before determining the winner. Uh, the winner of each round gains advantage to be used in the, in the bout as normal. 
The first character to reach 10 total success level is the winner. And for every toughness bonus worth of rounds that pass without a winner, you gain the plus one fatigued condition as you're going down. So key things, and then you remove that after five minutes of rest, but it, it, will, uh, it could potentially affect how the game goes. So arm wrestling is a very strength focused thing, obviously. The Scarlet Empress is a game involves securing the best hand possible from two rounds of trading cards and drawing new ones whilst trying to avoid the Scarlet Empress card. Everyone puts a stake into the pot and then takes an average gambling test. If it's a draw, uh, so then you look at the success levels. If it's a draw, all players either add another stake or drop out of the game. This continues until there is a clear winner who takes the pot. So, uh, neither of you guys have the Towers of Tower of Memories talent that can affect this game because you can card count <laughs> if you want to cheat. So, and I think uh, seating has uh, let's say two other you know marks who are playing the game with her. So there'll be two other potential characters who are be gambling in there. So what do you guys? How do you guys want to start your your evening? See if we win more money, we could get more alcohol for Sally to boost her confidence in the arm wrestling contest. Um, once I think I made up most of our money for the night, then I'll have a drink with her. So do, do we think we should try and both get in the same game to give us, uh, you know, better chance or play individually for better winning? How good are you gambling, Sally? Well, I've, I've had a few rounds. Uh, I mean, meta terms, it's 42, but... <laughs> Okay, um, I'm substantially more experienced at gambling. Wow, let me just finish up this drink while you start off with a bit of gambling. I'll see how it goes. I think it might increase our odds if we both gamble at the same time. But it will cut our winnings, sort of, because we'd be taking money from each other. They're going in the same pot, so. It also doubles your chance of losing then, I guess because you're putting twice as much money in. If you lose, you lose twice as much as you would with just one person. Yeah, let, let's see how you get on. I'll just uh, have a quick drink. Well, I'm definitely not arm wrestling like that guy. Okay. <laughs> He's too strong to be that old. Okay. Uh, Sally, do you wish to arm wrestle or are you gonna wait this drink? I'm just gonna watch this first round of cards. Okay. And uh, see how much scotch courage this drink gives me so amorous as you come in let me see if i've got a character sheet for seating as you walk over um someone is grousing uh as i do i do i do look at that as an npc sheet that's great um she's very tiny too like they're only about three feet tall and the thing about halflings um, in the old world is what they're sort of known for is having just disgusting senses of humor. They're foul. They're not like hobbits who are like nice and prim and proper. They're fucking disgusting <laughs> degenerates. Gotcha. Uh, so, um... I think I'll make use of my uh, acute senses to make sure there's no shady shifting going on on those cards while we're playing. Okay. Well, you can try. Okay, yeah, that's, so that's what I mean. here is what we're going to do. So if you're going to sit down, and Sally's sitting in the back hat watching this over, uh, I, she, uh, you know, um, well, hello. You want into the next hand, do you? I would absolutely love to, to, to gamble with you. One of the frustrated humans who's sitting there uh, says, takes one shilling. Ooh, plink, that's a... Plink. It's a little... Uh, High for my blood, but uh, I'll take it as entertainment. Okay. And he'll pull out a shilling and... <laughs> One of his two. <laughs> yeah, so it's down in the pot. Uh, would, you, do you, uh, would you like me to roll first uh, for the... To see what you're rolling against? Sure. That okay. sounds good. <laughs> All right, so these will be against... Oh, you know what? I've got uh, stats out of... Here. Let's see what the... 
other chumps are, are rolling. I think there's a uh, caravan guard and there is a coachman who are uh, also both humans who are involved with this. Let's see, I think their gambling is probably not great. Go. Yeah, so it'll be 30, uh, but this is an average test, so it'll be plus 20. So I'm rolling against a 50, uh, 5 0 on this. They have no modifiers. One got a, a success level 3, failed. Success level minus 4. Uh, and then seeding. Seedling, not seeding, seedling. And you realize as soon as you sit down, like this is, um, she's definitely a uh, skilled gambler. Okay. Ooh, but not there. I am going to spend one of her luck skills, or her luck to, uh, well, that again. These character sheets for the NPCs are really good. Failure again, not a good hand for her. Okay, I think again. she's like, uh, narratively speaking, I think she's not playing to her own must to, 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 to like pull, pull yeah, me yeah, in and get yeah. my defenses down. Yeah. So he'll uh, in, you're in. You he'll gotta let him win eyebrow. the first couple of rounds to get him, get them really on the hook. So and, uh, we're currently, it's a success level uh, three that is the best roll. So go ahead and give us a gambling check at plus 20. Okay. With, at an average. There you go. Yeah, he's uh, he's he's playing it calm. He's just for arching an imperceptible eyebrow, just watching. Yeah, I'm on to you, seedling. There you go. So because you are in, you know, you put we see the cards going back and forth. You put together a really terrific set. She goes, she's like, ah, you played before then, and you can I, take three. Uh, so you gain your shilling back and three more. Uh, I respond like it's not my first time playing. Okay. But uh, one of you has some fairly good skill. Okay. Uh, she says, wow, it'll make for an interesting evening then. And starts shuffling again faster than before. Uh, and about that time, what you see is the door opens. It takes about 10 minutes of that. Sally, I'm fairly confident you're done your other drink by that point. You'll give us another consume alcohol check? Yeah, I want to. <laughs> <sighs> No problem. Second one goes even better than the first one. Okay. Then um, the door opens and what walks in are... Get a hand out here. I'll show you where they position themselves afterwards. They look like... Where are they? Get the thing here. Travelers come in out of the rain, they hang their heavy cloaks and hats by the fire, and order three hot meals. And they look like this. I'll put down the. Scalders of some kind, perhaps. Let me see if I've got a token for them. S scholars. Emerson's eyebrow goes way up. He looks over. <laughs> Go. Uh, let's see here. The wet scholars, and I'll place them get rid of that bar. Three of them take a seat at C. There we are. 
Then, Sally, you hear boom again from behind you as Bruno. <laughs> You're not as mighty as Bruno. <laughs> you think you can beat the Graven's judicial champion? Come, who is next? And you see there's a lot of coins moving around there as well, Sally. Amherst, are you being dealt in on this next hand? Yes, although he's somewhat distracted by the scholars at the table C. Okay. Sally, are you still watching or are you going to get involved with either the gambling or the arm wrestling or just hanging back? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the two drinks now are sort of tempting her towards this boisterous Bruno character, but I mean, he is going to be strong. We know that. But I'm wondering if he's weakening himself over the night. Perhaps. Uh, what she think? I mean, she's going to go over there and say, is, is someone doing a book of some description for the betting? Uh, someone's keeping odds? track of it for Bruno. But yeah, it's basically yeah. like there's betting going on around him um, amongst like friends, but he's the one who's staking it. If you want to stake him, I believe it's four shillings. What, four shillings to give him a match? No, one... one no, what, oh, yeah, well, two, two shillings, sorry, two shillings for a match with him. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see if this, this guy is handling the money. What, what about if uh, a noble lady would take on Bruno? What sort of return would you get What would such you, a victory? Uh, Bruno kind of looks up at you and he says, I'm not for hire. I have an employer for judicial champion, but I'll, I'll um, wrestle you. And surely, and surely, uh, if I were to win, I would win a considerable amount. Such a mighty, a mighty arm wrestler as you should have uh, no problem. Let me take a look here. Let's see what his, I check out stats for Bruno as well. I know my chances are slim, but if I'm going to take my chance, I want to get, make sure I get reward for it. Okay, let's see here. He has make a roll for him here. His eyes narrow. He says, "Put up five shillings, and you will win five shillings when you beat me, noble lady." And he kind of he wants ugh, flexes his shirtless chest again as he says it. So he wants me to bet five shillings to win ten, basically. Uh, correct. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, Sally doesn't want to lose face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Point. Everyone's kind of ooh in the crowd as he says it. Yes. Yeah, she uh, unwisely, with a little bit of drink, inside puts the five shillings on the table ah! the crowd around it are all cheering uh amaris you can hear it from behind you and then you hear the sound of foot, 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 foot cards being laid in front of you yeah amaris's head just tilts to the side as he's sighing internally <laughs> hoping he doesn't have to make up another five shillings all right he does not want to piss off the tavern so he yeah, puts his hand down for you you clasp up and the crowd is all kind of like oh, 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 oh. there's a little bit of money exchanging hands between some of the uh barge workers i'll do the same thing i'll roll and i'll tell you what i'm uh what the success level is so um he has a now that you clasp hands with him you have a sense of just how strong this gentleman is because he has a strength of 69. <clears throat> good number good number <laughs> It'll be a it's flat strength check. He adds plus six to this. Uh, I will note one of his trappings is listed as bulging biceps. <laughs> nothing oh, to worry about. Nothing to worry bulging about. Bulging biceps of Bruno will brutalize you. Here we go. I will remind <laughs> as well. Remember, you can spend resolve to automatically get a success level one on this if you choose to. Or not a resolve. A, yeah, resolve, not a resilience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so here we go. Let me roll what... Uh, oops, that's the wrong thing. Let me roll. Here we go. Sure, this will go well. D100. I'm rolling against... Oh, what the fuck? Fuck, fuck, fuck. Come on. Get, get, get. Oh, for Pete's sake. Isn't, isn't the arm wrestling like a... a... 
endurance thing? Uh, no, it's as I, I like. I, I did read out the rules a, a moment ago. Yeah, uh, ten, but yeah. What ten, it is, you roll it. Six levels. Yeah, you, it's a it's yeah. a contested strength roll. But yeah, your toughest bonus once you get beyond that in rounds. Uh, so we'll have to track the rounds here. So here we go. Round one. Uh, his so against a sixty nine. That is a success level of zero plus his strength of six. So you, what is your your strength is what? Uh, Forty uh, something. Thirty six. 36? Yeah. So you get to add plus three to your... So when it gives you success level modifier, add three into that. Because you do get to add your strength bonus into that. So let's see. You need to beat a six. Uh, what target bonus? Oh, no. Uh, it's target bonus, none. SL bonus. SL bonus, yeah. Put three in there, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Critical success! Uh, <laughs> you know what I'll do is we'll double your... Oh, Chris, I guess plus four. What does that mean, plus four? Well, two under. So maybe that's doubled it to four under? Is that what it's done? Me? Yeah. Because mine's 36. So oh, yeah, so double, yeah, plus, successes, and plus three, so it's seven. It? So actually, you're at one. So you've actually started, uh, his his arm is starting to uh, go in the one direction. The crowd's like, uh, and you get advantage for this because you get the momentum. So go ahead and uh, put yourself down with one advantage because it will add, I believe it'll add directly to the roll. Yeah, let's see, hopefully. Um, plus one. And yeah. then we'll oh, go Sally. on to the next round. So uh, I'm again rolling against a 69. It's a 51, so I got a total success level of seven. As he's trying to go back against you, go ahead and roll yours, same as before. Oh, you know what? Hold on. Was it an average test or was it challenging? So that should be challenging. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. We'll keep it for the first one. Let's do it for the second round. Okay, let me change that. So, challenging. And then you're adding plus three to your uh, success yep. level. Um, and then I'll see if the uh, the other bonus comes in. Uh, so it was rolling against a target number of 30. No, it should be 46. So Yeah, I don't think it did the advantage because it's maybe not a combat roll. Oh, probably that's why. Yeah, yeah. So add, why don't you add, as a target number thing, add a 10. You know, let's try, re go ahead, you can re-roll. Let's see if that works out properly. And the success level bonus will be three. Just trying to get us a challenge. Target. So, target bonus 10, should I put it? 10, in? yeah, for your advantage. Yeah. Okay. And then success level bonus will be 3. Look at that. All right. So then, that's where success 3, 5. Unfortunately, he got a 7. So he uh, it goes down a little bit and then it's like, <laughs> you lose your advantage, he gains advantage. Mm. All right, next round. He's rolling against. So how, many, how many did he win by two? He won by two. Mm. And so, we're trying to get to 10, was it? Trying to get to 10. A first to 10 is the winner. So, what, what's the running score here? Yeah, um, so you guys, he's currently at the net of two success levels. It's when you make a roll and. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, no, hold on. Actually, we don't need we don't need to worry about that. It's just uh, the fact that he beat you too. He beat you. It's whether his total success level is gonna be a ten. At some point, someone's gonna have so much advantage. Yeah, right. you know to get it down. Uh, okay, so it's and this is where the endurance comes in. Is that after yeah, what is your toughest hard. bonus? Uh it's only three. Only three. So, yeah. So you can next well, but actually, I've got endurance. Do you use just toughness or do you use endurance? Uh, use toughness. It's the toughness bonus we're looking for. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. so that's only three. Endurance All right. So then for this next one, he is rolling against a 79 because of the advantage. That's a by one. So I, I got a total success level of seven. All right. So I'm back Jeez. down to just the plus three now. Oof, that's bad. Hey. Uh... So the net, uh, he slams your hand down on the table with a four. Oh, no, that's four. Minus one. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a fortune on that. I'm okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. That's just yep. too much. Come on, let's try it. Gotta give it a go. Isn't the 
or when you can automatically win it with a success or is that that's uh, resolve. resolve resolve but oh. those only come back when you get a yeah. extraordinary success for your motivation oh, no. Failure. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> slams your hand down into the table um why don't you give us a toughness check and an average toughness check let's see if you've injured yourself in this <laughs> okay so you're good ah. so and the only thing that is wounded is your pride but he slams your hand on the table and you're ah and as soon as you let go his hand goes out and snatches that five shillings of yours and <laughs> stands up bruno <laughs> Then Amrus, uh, let's see how your <laughs> card game went in the interim. So, um, just shaking his head over there, like I think that's the loudest he's heard that table bounce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the uh, you're rolling against a. Let me, let me roll for the two uh, gamblers. They're rolling against a fifty. Uh, so one is a fail by three, fail by two, and then we'll roll for seedling. Did I leave her open? I did not. Go. She's looking at you over the cards as she's dealing them out. Her little I'm eyes. I'm attempting to narrow. look very distracted by the noise behind me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's see here what you're rolling against. It's average. A six. Levels. Go ahead. Give us a average gamble check there, Amorous. I'm gonna uh, turn his attention back to the table and narrow his eyes. Oh. Now, you can spend fortune to increase your levels of success as well, but as an elf, you've only got the one. Yeah. You want to re-roll so or you want to take the L? We want to take the L this time. Just, you okay. know, she had the appearance of looking weak. This time he's looking distracted. Again, he's going to try to throw her off her game. Okay. So you lose one shilling. Gotcha. From, from your stake. Oh. Because she is a clear okay. winner. All That's right. Okay. We're, up, we're up two so far. Uh, you can, well, say you can do one more hand while Bruno's uh, arm wrestling was going with that. So let me okay. roll for, oh, that's what's going on here. There we go. Awesome. Okay. Um, so the, they are not very good gamblers. So that's a failure by, it's a zero and a fail by three. And then let's see how Seedling does. Oh, I did leave it open. There we go. Gamble. Ooh, failure. She is lucky though. I'm gonna spend a fortune and uh, re-roll that. She wants your money. She does. <laughs> 10. Okay, okay. Amaris? I'm gonna sit up straight and he's looking at her the whole time, just <laughs> watching her hands. You and they're such she's small hands are moving so quickly. Let's see. Will skill play out or will luck win? You'll lose another shilling. As, That's fine. Uh, That's... Seedling takes another hand. I'm still up by one. Okay. <laughs> then uh, it is, uh, let's see here. So I guess uh, in, the, in the immediate aftermath of, um, what do you call it? Immediate aftermath of the, uh, um, losing the uh, uh, the arm wrestling competition, uh, Sally. What do you wish to do? And uh, yeah, Bruno, as he you know he what, what's the expression on your face? I suppose as he looks over at you. Um, no, I, I, I think she'll play it off as just the big grin. You know, it's expected. You know, it's a bl big strong bloke of a versus a woman. Yeah. You know what? What did you expect? Sort of thing. She'll put a flash fancy hat back on hey. and just stroll off as if it was just you know just a few pennies and just for a bit of a game yeah you know, yeah well, well done and, well, and give, just us, sort give of... us a charm check and you get plus 10 to it there'll be an average charm check uh, and a plus 10 from your um your status because you're definitely higher status than bruno okay oof you want to fortune that or? Yeah, I'm going to fortune it. I'm not having yeah. that. That seems. Here we go. 
There we go. Uh, so the crowd is all like, oh, oh, she's still. And uh, Bruno says, uh, your next drink, my lady, on me, please. And he tosses the thing, and the crowd's kind of like, oh, to him as well. And he's like, next yeah. challenger. And some other, you know, big lad comes in. So you uh, you definitely have left a good impression. As you're making your way over towards the bar, Amherst is still there, you know, uh, intent with um, the uh, the game, the furious game of cards that's uh, going on. Mm -hmm. You see the door open, and then uh, a curious character walks in. Who looks like... <laughs> like this. Yeah. Now, as he walks in the door, Looks like a halfling to you. But I think um, you can each give us a, let me see here. You know what's uh, pretty awesome? Skill-based RPG with the skill list in the GM screen. All right. Uh, what are your lore? Oh, yeah, Amherst, you've got no lore uh, skills, right? Nope. Okay, and uh, so, Held so you're doing... uh, Heraldry, Reichland, and Warfare. Okay, okay. Uh, I don't think any of those would apply in this, so why don't you each give us a, <laughs> let's say a hard, minus 20, hard intelligence check. This is a bit of uh, obscure lore. I'm just curious if you've come across something before. Long shot. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> barely fell down. Yeah, one. that's uh, that's pretty good. Do you want a fortune that, uh, Amherst? <laughs> you got a decent I need chance. my fortune. I need oh, my we fortune. only get the one. Right, 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 right. Yes. Yeah. So I got. Oh, we're not lucky. We we rely on our uh, superior skill. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, okay, where is he here? Although Amaris will be like a uh, coin pouch, chest pocket. Yeah, he, um... Okay, I don't have a, uh, a token for him, so I'll use this This guy here. wants my pouch. He's going to have to crawl into my freaking jacket to find it. Um, he appears, to, to your eyes, appears to be a halfling. So this is uh, at 8, uh, or sorry, 9, uh, 9.15. He walks in. He makes his way up to the Let's see, let's see. Makes his way up to the bar, grabs a drink, and then comes up and grabs a seat next to you, Amorous. Can I be dealt it? Can I be dealt in? And the seedling says, no, it's of course you can. And he takes a seat at the table as well. So next hand, Emerson, we'll have this fellow sitting in on it. Emerson uh, looks over and gives him a nod and a, a welcoming smile. Okay. He nods. Hello. And let's see here. Amaris, would you give us an intuition check, please? Absolutely. That's the I, right? Yeah. Average? Oh, it's, it's actually a skill. Uh, under, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, is it? I, I, it is a skill under intuition. Uh, and this okay. will be uh, no challenging, please. Challenging. We're, we're looking for success okay. level here. Okay. All right. So you sit down to um, have your next hand. Uh, Amherst, are you dealing in on the next one? Yes, this will be the guessing the last round because if uh, if I lose this one, we'll break even pretty much. So. Okay. Do you have any money 
on you that is not on the table. Yes, in my coin pouch that I put in my chest pocket, so no shortlings can reach it. Um, nope. Sorry. The moment I saw him walk through the door, I knew something was happening. I was okay. Like, nope. So then, um, the uh, any other money? Uh, you, and we'll, we'll when you go back into your coin pouch because you've got if you got the money in the table. I'm assuming you're not going into it. When you go back in, that's when you will discover that it is gone. So, um. Your shillings are on the table. If you're planning on being in on this next round, then let's deal in. Sally, what are you doing? Do you want to join the uh, yeah. gamblers? Um, or... I was interested in these uh, these scholars. Do they look sort of noble in uh, descent? Sort of? Yeah, give us a... Um, let me think here. You can give us a... Uh, Lord Reichland check, if you like. Okay. And this will be, I think it'll be, uh, oh, sorry, I was going to set the target number. Uh, that, that's actually really, really good. Uh, they look like, honestly, students and scholars. And one of the things you would know is that in amongst the different uh, universities, there are, like, there are in our world fraternities and secret societies and stuff like that. And they're not always sinister, um, but these folks seem to have, they have that kind of... Um, cliqueishness that makes you think that they are all part of the same uh, same group and I think with a role that good I can actually tell you what you probably have come across what uh, university they are from Un perhaps unsurprisingly given how close it is uh, they are from the University of Nuln you're not quite sure I think what uh, what society these guys may be from and they're, they aren't displaying like any overt symbols or whatnot on it, but they just have that look of students who are all part of a fraternity or society or whatever it's called, whatever they, they, their particular thing is called. All right, mm. then, um, Amorous, uh, if you were gonna go in, let me make the rolls for the other two who are in there. Oopsies, oh, not that, there we go. So the coachman, ooh, they got a three. A four, and shh, let's see here, for seedling. A four, there is a tie, wow. so it may go another round. And for this fellow, his name incidentally uh, is Odd Socks. And his gamble, his gamble is not that great. I'm rolling against a 70. Uh, for him. That's a three. So currently there's two ties at four. If you can beat a four, Amorous. Alrighty, let's see what we got. Yeah, you know, he's looking at the crowd is like this uh, little halfling has brought uh, a load of luck to the table. Now you could spend your fortune to add one success level. Uh, yes, we'll do that. Okay, so you so have just to... like, yeah, this time he's, uh, I don't know, he's, he's doing something. Um, he's just like, uh, I don't know. How would I? So here's, let me give you the other option here too. The other option is that's a four way tie. That means you either pay into the pot, the pot gets bigger and then you roll again, or you can spend your fortune point and win this one. Say so just win this one. Okay. So that means a net of one, two, three, four shillings you're winning from this one. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to take the winnings and I'm gonna put a shilling down on the table and says, drinks for everyone, have fun. I'm, I'm gonna go nurse my friend's wounds for losing. Okay. So you walk up to where Shally is and I think it's at that point that you realize that your coin purse is missing. <sighs> So Sally, he gets up and he starts walking towards you and there's this defeated expression on his face as he's reaching inside his jacket. I think perhaps you might uh, recognize that. <clears throat> Your luck didn't hold up then. Oh, it held. Um, but the skill of another uh, tipped the odds in their favor. Luckily for him, uh, I have most of the winnings here. Unlikely for it. Okay. 
So it's, as you guys are talking to one another, what happens next is a servant, uh, Liv Reed, you know, clearly part of the Graven's retinue, comes downstairs, stands behind Bruno. This is a, you know, just a perfumed kind of, you know, li like um, well-dressed type who looks down at him and says the, I don't think neither of you guys have lip reading, right? No. No? What, what would that be? Under? That's a, that would be a, an advantage or a talent. Oh, no. No, okay. Then why don't you give us a perception uh, check each and we'll put this at, uh, let's make it challenging, please. Too distracted. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So here's what you can see what happens. You can't hear it. You can see he comes down and the, the servant says something to Bruno. And then you hear kind of a as he quickly stands up and the chair kind of screeches back. He looks down and Bruno is like from the collarbone up taller than this guy and just looms over him. He says something back because he gestures with his great big, you know, meaty hands. And then the servant kind of shrinks back and then turns and makes their way back upstairs. What would you guys like to do next? Bruno then turns and sits down and gets ready to start uh, uh, arm wrestling further. Um, Seedling's game is still going, so if you wish to rejoin that, you're welcome to. Sal, you have yet to give uh, the gambling a try. Yeah, Emerson mm -hmm. will tell... Uh... Sally, uh, don't sit next to the uh, the bushy bearded one. Um, <laughs> if you're gonna gamble, you guys want to take a seat uh, at the bar or what? Yeah, my funds Actually, are somewhat limited. Amorous wants to go talk to those scholars because they drew his interest earlier. But uh, he'll he'll pass off two shillings to Sally. Um, say this is half what I got left. Okay, the winnings. Hmm. Good work. Well, it would have been more, but... All right, so Sally, you go and uh, put yourself at the bar here, I guess. And then Amherst, you wish to go over and... Okay. Yes. So they are talking amongst themselves in kind of a conspiratorial way, and then they notice you walking over. Um, what do you say? Uh, he puts on a what he thinks is a like a charming smile and says, um, Greetings. Uh, you have the look of scholars. I, uh, I'm a merchant, and I am seeking rare books. You wouldn't happen to have any information on you? Sure, you? why don't you give us a charm check at challenging, please. I had it a second ago, and I lost it. There it is. Okay. Uh, let's see. Hey! Nice! So you are one charming motherfucker. Um, you also can, um, mm, 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 mm. I think it's intuition. Let me just double check here. Let's see if it's to get a, a sense of these people. Yeah. Hmm. No, it's not that. I'm trying to see whether there's. Uh, I think intuition is what I want. Um, let me just make sure perception isn't the. Yeah, I think it's not... intuitions to read people. I yeah, think... that's what I'm thinking is. So why don't you give us think, an intuition it's... check as well? Again, at uh, challenging, please, Amherst. Intuition challenging. Don't also really good so you think walk I'm, up. I'm uh, vibing with their like they, their wet braggle and i just got stolen from so i'm kind of like on the same wavelength okay so you go over and but here's the, the impression you get is they all seem they give you the impression that they just stopped suddenly talking about something they really don't want you to overhear and they look up and uh they Oh, you know what's curious? Yeah, they answer you with, um, 
definitely sophisticated, like cosmopolitan Nuln accents. But they say, I'm sorry, sir, we have no such books. And then another one says, and uh, I am sorry, sir, but the day's travel has been quite long. And one of them kind of looks over at the, at the other one like, oh, good idea. As if like they were, clearly there's some kind of machinations that that's going on here and they don't want you to be part of it. But they are, you have left a very good impression. So they, they haven't been rude as of yet. Well, he'll uh, he'll uh, give them a, just a slight bow, um, you know, kind of respecting their their station as far as career choice. It says, "Well, um, I I know the road has been hard traveled, um, and if you'd like some more hot food to uh, to make your stay pleasant, maybe we can speak more in the morning." Uh, they all sort of look at one another. Maybe, sir. Maybe. Enjoy your evening," says another one. Like, uh, and, uh, one of them, the, uh, the youngest of them, is, is like nervously turning their drink around on their table. Ner the t and the drink is completely full. If these people were exhausted or, or parked from the road. They're giving no indication that that's the case. So he'll, uh, he'll, he'll take note of that um, and just nod and say, if you, well, if you find any such things or hear or know of someone that could supply that, I would uh, be eager to hear. I would even pay for your time and good evening then oh. good, good good evening so heading back and he's eyeballing that short halfling at the table the whole time <laughs> yeah he uh uh let's do this Just give us a an intuition check please okay i mean he, he may not even know or not i mean he just did, uh, challenging st again uh yes challenging again uh, whenever there's gonna be a contested thing it's usually challenging oh. you're rolling against because we're trying to figure out what the success levels are doesn't seem to be giving you any notice whatsoever. So you kind of, you go and you sit back down with Sally. Um, Sally, you've just been sort of watching the things. You hear a bang as another, you know, victory is uh, ratcheted up for Bruno. And that is when you hear someone walking down the stairs with incredible intent and flanked by three other servants. That is the Graven. She walks down right up to Bruno, and it is, uh, you, while you cannot hear what she has said, she gestures up the stairs as if like, um, there are guards in here too, I should say. What you guys can do, if you wanna, you know, indulge in that favorite pastime of um, uh, adventurers everywhere and, or at least travelers everywhere and gossip, that would be a charm, an average charm check to, or, sorry, no, no. There's a gossip skill. There's a gossip skill, yeah, or an opposed gossip and cool test to get a, to see if you can figure out what the hell's going on here. Why she I got- I love to engage in that. Okay. So what you see is, uh, uh, you'll have an opportunity to do that. She gestures, Bruno gets up and like, uh, the Graven is, she's not, like huge for a woman, but she's not short either. But Bruno is much bigger than her. Bruno seems like a chastened pet. Gets up and kind of his uh, sulkily grabs his stuff, grabs his winnings, and um, you can hear one of the guards comes over, or one of the guards, one of the three servants that came down, walks past you guys, speaks to the landlord, and orders dinner for the Graven's party. Bruno sulkily makes his way up the stairs followed by the Graven and her companions, leaving you guys alone. Um, some of the other servants go upstairs, but there's still enough down here to gossip. So here's what you can do. You could use charm uh, to try and buy some drinks uh, for these folks to open up the opportunity to gossip with these guards. Some of them are probably sitting at um, maybe one of the tables or at the bar with you guys. Um, and if you do succeed in that, then you could try and ply him with um, gossip or try and get gossip and get some information out of them. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think I'll give that a try. Can I use my sort of noble yes. status? 
to you try and... Both of you guys, the guards would be brass. Uh, caravan guards would be brass stationed, so both of you would have a higher station. You both would get plus 10 okay. on a charm okay. check. And it's and or. You don't need to buy drinks. You can buy drinks if you don't want to bother with that to then engage in gossip. Uh, you could try and charm them and then engage in gossip without having to buy anything. What do you guys think? And let me, let's talk about uh, assisted roles as well. We haven't had that come up oh, yet. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you guys can work together on this. Do a tag team. Yeah. I think it's only plus 10. Isn't Assistance it? is plus 10 to the test. Yeah. Yeah. What do you guys think? Is your, are you pretty charming? Uh, I'm, I'm fairly charming, yes. Yeah, you're slightly better than me. So, wh why don't you lead and I'll try and uh, add a bit of female companionship to the uh, an assist along. Okay. They're, they're guards, though. Wouldn't that be slumming in your station? I do, uh, you, you know what? Um, any, even then, an attractive... A higher station woman uh, flattering uh, a lower station man, it's very likely that's going to help. Just worried yeah. about his image. Yeah. You know, we're about to engage in some gossip, so, you know. Oh, no, so. I mean, it, it'll be done on a classy level. Oh, okay. Are you sure? And he looks at <laughs> oh, your classy third... as fuck, I say. <laughs> He's glancing down at your third beer that you're about to start. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Bruno's beer is going down well. Yeah. So then, oh, let's see. Yeah, speaking of which, why, Sally, why don't you give us a consume alcohol check, please? Oh, I'd hope you forgot that. <laughs> I didn't. Oh. Hmm. So what a failure I've, does, yeah, unless you wish I've, to spend... You're not drunk by any means. You're just... Uh, no. Maybe it's not quite as classy as I It might thought. actually work more in your favor because that explains why you're actually doing it. So you yeah. get yeah. minus 10 to weapon skill, ballistic skill, agility, dex, and intelligence. Uh, to a... Uh, but you keep drinking. You're not stinking drunk yet. No, no, we'll go with that. Nah, she okay. seems quite quite happy to be a little bit merry. All right. So then, what um what it'll be is Amherst is going to give us a uh, an average charm check, but you're going to gain plus ten from Sally helping you and plus ten from your station. So it'll be a plus twenty. So target bonus twenty. Got it. And Mary put twenty, not the plus twenty. Holy smokes! Astounding success. So what is it we see, Amrus, as you slide in? How do you charm your way into their hearts? Maybe I'm appealing to, you know, um, I know they're, they're probably not happy to be here guarding some, you know, high, hoity toity, high no, noble, um, and there's some drama going on, and they're not paying for enough drinks. And I'll, won't well, buy drinks for them, but I'll bring over some money and say uh so just be clear hold on because like narratively if you're spending money in this game you got to take it off your character sheet your charm is good enough you do not need to do okay. that okay. Remember that was an and or okay uh i think he'll just uh uh not saunter on in there because that's he doesn't saunter um but maybe he is fascinated by like certain parts of the human culture yeah. um, and especially the servant roles that guards take up and so he approaches them and I don't know just kind of I think if you, you to give you a, a, throw a pitch a pitch here the elves in this are, are kind of like they are in uh, like they're not quite like you know um, Tolkien's elves where they're like you know there's a magical aura kind of around them or whatnot but they are still like classy as fuck like they're very uh, you know their voices are are lyrical they're you know like they're a very they're not just pointy-eared humans who live a long time they're a very different people when you have someone who's so different and and kind of enchanting like that combined with an enthusiasm to learn about people and a willingness to engage with them imagine how it's almost like from, from that role what it tells me is like you've just shone a light on these people of this kind of like you know hot um scrappy uh, nobleman or noblewoman in addition to this elf they want to fucking hang out with us yeah okay so like uh, I think he comes uh, in and starts just appealing to the, like how expressing how noble it is to you know take up a servant position and guarding the higher class and he'd love to hear about you know the struggles that they go with so he's he can you know spread the news out to the world with his book he's writing and you know 
Yeah. Something something along those lines. Like he wants to like immortalize them in in you know a book and Yeah, yeah. So you're gonna let you do, that let's roll forward some of that success into your so why don't you give us a they they definitely they want to hear you. Come on, sit down, sit down, sit down. Why don't we roll forward half of those success levels into your gossip roll? Okay. Okay, so we'll do add four when it gives you the, the bonus or the prompting for success level. Uh, is gossip a basic skill or is basic is gossip a uh, advanced? It's it's basic. A nice one. Okay, so then uh, Sally, if you're also indulging in this, it'll be yep. a plus ten. Uh, so and hold on, let me check if because we just look it up and we don't have to look it up again. Let me actually first check and see if it's on the game master screen. I want to know whether your status adds to gossip. I think gossip might be the one that you need to be at the same level or you take a penalty. Um, let's see here. Is it on screen? It is not. I don't think. Okay, unfortunately, there we go. Advantage. I love how nitty gritty the rules are with this. It's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great. All, I mean, the the, the uh, success level component is is something that plays in in a lot of the uh, Warhammer games since at least since those uh, Fantasy Flight forty k ones. But it's uh, it's something I really like about the uh, this particular version of the game. Okay, here we go. Status. So it's, is it before or after the professions? Mm. It is before the professions in the character. I was reading it last night to make sure I was boning up on these things. Okay. Uh, any gossip between individuals of different tiers suffers a penalty of minus 10. Okay. So you'll be an average check at um, plus 10. No, uh, sorry, an average check at uh, no modifier with a success level bonus of four. Okay. Critical success. Incredible. Nice. All right. Uh, so then what, here's what you um, learn from over the course of the, you know, let's see, how long is it? Something's going to happen while you guys are chatting uh, in this. Uh, but it, over the course of chatting with these folks, here's what you learn. Um, I mentioned that the Graven is from Nuln. And let, let me just give you the map once again so you can kind of follow along with this as a handout. And I will load a better uh, map of uh, the immediate region, uh, a better one than what we've got here. Amorous is plotting revenge. <laughs> on the, uh, what do you call it? On that. Uh, yes. His sticky fingers might be, you know, skilled in certain areas, but gossip is mine. <laughs> nice. Okay, it's loading. Come on. Come on, you little horse. There we go. So, guys, here's the map. Nuln, you can see, is down there in the south. Remember that you guys are just a little north of Grisenwald. If you follow the Reich River up to the north, you can see there is a town or a, a community called Kemperbad. You see that? Yes. So they are going, the Graven and her people are going to Kemperbad to deal with some kind of legal matter. Well, let me get rid of that fucking... It dropped onto the map instead of going on the uh, handout. Um, it has to do with the death of a party held by uh, death. Sorry, death of a guest at a party held by the Graven's aunt, the Countess Emmanuel von Liebowitz of Nuln. And because of your critical success, they are happy to give you a little more detail. Okay, this is all fascinating information go on and he starts like taking notes so what's happened is there was a local baron a baron otto van damenblatz a minor noble from the duchy of dunkelberg he was found dead face down in a punch bowl at uh, countess emmanuel's 
recent party. His son, the Baron Eberhard von Damenblatz, has accused the Graven of causing his father's death through poisoning or witchcraft. Everyone in the Graven's party, and these guys can tell you, everyone there, everyone thinks the Baron drank himself into unconsciousness, slumped comatose into the punch bowl, and then just died. He drank himself literally to death. Interesting. But his son has accused uh, the Graven, and such accusations must be answered. One of the ways you can answer that is through a court of law. What the Graven was fearful of is corruption. Her fear was that she would not get a fair trial. So instead, she, as is her right, argued for trial by combat. And as is also her right, she is entitled to hire a judicial champion to serve as her champion and fight in her stead. Would you guys like to guess who her judicial champion is? Bruno. Correct. That is where they are traveling. They're going to um, Kemperbat to have a judicial combat to determine her guilt. I need not tell you witchcraft. Death is the consequence, even in the face of uh, even when you are a noble. So this is a pretty serious accusation. Do you guys have any other questions you wish to pose to the guards while they are chatting with you and gossiping? Suppose uh, the, the noble isn't too pleased of her uh, her champion uh, potentially injuring himself on the, on the way up there. Most the definitely about. not. Um... <laughs> I, uh, they weren't up there when they heard it, but uh, the Graven is certainly as is, you know, want for their kind. They're not shy in sharing their opinions. If the Graven came down and sent him basically up to bed, you know, he already effectively, when he told that, what must have happened is he told that first servant who came down, must have told him to, you know, fuck off. That's effectively, he's the servant of the Graven. It's him telling her to fuck off, so... <laughs> Is, is there any kind of relation between the, the noble and Bruno as far as like, you know, like how does she know him? Yeah, no. Well, how does she know him? Is like a servant of the, the oh, family? Oh, it's, it's, it's a job you can have in the old world. You can serve okay. as uh, if you happen to be a really capable warrior and you're willing to serve as them. And there's not a reason why you, you know, you're not a bandit or whatever else. Or at least people don't know that you're a bandit. You can serve as a ju judicial champion. It's just that it's a crazy dangerous job to be in because... The if it does go to that, others will hire comparable judicial champions, and you may be facing them. Mm. Is it a fight to the death situation? Typically, that challenge, depending yeah. on the nature of the accusations. This is a murder charge, so probably, probably. Mm. Wow, risky business. It's so, uh, good work if you can get it, but uh, <laughs> she must be paying him well. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Amherst will lean into the guards and like, this has been fascinating and I thank you for all your time, but um, just, you know, to make your guys' night go a lot smoother, just be aware that there is a, uh, a pickpocket in the inn um, and we would not like the lady to be uh, inconvenienced further. So guard your coin pouches and uh, have a good night. They appreciate that. So while you guys are and talking... Amherst will he'll, he'll look over yeah. at the halfling at the table just as he says, watch your coin purses, and then just smile and walk away. Okay. So here's what, uh, the door opens. Uh, it's still raining outside. It's now evening. It is now um, 9.30. Door opens. And what walks in? Time is going by so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because like with these, um, with role play heavy games like this, um, it just like the time flies by because you just, yeah. Okay, this is who walks in the door. 
Now, I feel sorry for these ladies. <laughs> these guys are so <laughs> ugly. <laughs> what you see, they go in, and uh, why don't you each give us a, let's see here. Now, one thing I was, let me double check something. One of the neat ways they in um, Rogue Trader, there's a difference between awareness and scrutiny, uh, or scrutinize, and it's because whether it's noticing something or looking for something. And I wonder if that's the same between intuition and um, perception. Yeah, intuition gives you subtle, implicit intelligence relating to your environment. Um, and then let's see what perception says. Perception. Mm, to detect something like movement behind a tree line. And multiple uses in combat. I'll let you make, guys, uh, you choose. Uh, you want to roll intuition or you want to roll perception. I'll let both of you roll. Must be an average roll. Uh, is this uh, this is going to be minus ten for me? Yeah. Yes. Because uh, it's intelligence. Yes, yeah, it's an intelligence check. Based. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. Sitting back. Uh, I'm going to go with intuition because I kind of feel like that's fitting in as a uh, an average, right? Yep. Okay. Even though intuition's lower, I still. <laughs> oh, Amber, it's holy smokes. <laughs> Yeah, my perception is higher, but I just intuition just felt right. Sally's having too much fun talking to the you know combat guys. She's also you had definitely have seen more action uh, than what uh, they have to give you guys a sense of what um, th these characters are. The, the pregens are built with two thousand XP, give or take. So they <laughs> what they say is that's that's roughly like twenty sessions of play. So that's where after that many sessions of play, your characters would be. So you have. Amorous and uh, Sally have been on many adventures since they, you know, uh, Sally broke uh, Amorous out of his father's kind of compound and stole from Amorous's cousin. So uh, they come in and they go over. Uh, there's also a um, uh, two boatmen who come in with them as well, suggesting they may have all come together. These two, with that level of success, uh, Amorous, these two seem like the 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 way that they sort of for one thing, um, the man definitely seems to be of a higher standing than what the woman is. Um they also have the giddiness and the kind of playfulness with one another that comes from only a couple of things. Um well, one of two things, I think. New lovers or secret lovers. So they yep. come to the uh, the front and they introduce themselves as um, Mr. and Mrs. Schmidt. And the woman kind of giggles at that. And the landlady says, oh, of course, of course, uh, we have your room. Uh, you do over here, they're in room 10, if that's of interest to you whatsoever. But they... Um, the boatman will grab uh, some food. The couple, without any supper or even a drink, very quickly disappear upstairs. Yeah, like when you showed the picture, I was like, "Oh, I think I know what's going on here." And the <laughs> second option was definitely at the higher end of my illicit affairs. Ooh, yeah, gossip. So you can see the boatman take a, a seat at the um, uh, at the bar to have a quick. Um, you have some quick hot food and then uh, some uh, have a drink. But yeah, evening is uh, getting interesting. I want to gossip with the boatmen now. Okay, so you're about to uh, uh, to do so when the door opens and we'll end on this. Let me show you who walks in. The jilted lover of wife. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my husband? This is a busy bar, man. Yeah. No. <laughs> this is, just, again, uh, classic adventure. It's been in every edition of the game. It's fucking... I've run this once before using Iron Kingdoms instead of using uh, the Old World. Fucking great adventure. I, I should have looked at my skills beforehand because you, you can use sleight of hand to cheat at gambling. 
Nice. And uh, maybe before the end of that, I'm gonna get my money back from that little. Yeah. Well, the night is young. He's sleeping. Here's what opens, guys. The door opens and. Oh, Three no. priests of more come in. God of the dead, bearing someone seemingly destined for a final and ultimate destination. I think that's, guys, where we will end our session. <laughs> so we'll be back. Hold on, let me see. There is, this uh, only gives um, XP per adventure, but because you guys participate in the games, you get some XP from that. So let's see. What do you get? What do you get? Record that where experience. I think it is advances, probably. Okay. I would think you are correct. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, and there's like difference between earned and spent or whatever. Here we go. So each you will gain five XP for having this is not gonna be typical for the adventure. These particular things, one of the things they said that there are rules out of the core rule book if you want fast advancement to you know speed things along. Um, you get a flat amount per session. If you're playing a longer term, then do you go by what's in the uh, what do you call it in the uh, adventure. At the, out, uh, at the outcome of the adventure, you are likely to gain substantially more than that. So don't think you're going to be going up by fives. Um, but, yeah. With the Priest of more coming in at around 9.30, a little past, that's where we will... Oh, no, I can put them down so we have them for next time. Let me go. Servants of more, And again, the coal bar kind of oh, falls to a hush as they walk in. But we'll see what happens next in two weeks' time. So for those listening at home, where are we here? Ba -ba 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 -ba. There you are, guys. Standing so far, I love it. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's it's a really it, it's a really fucking good game. It's a great adventure as well. So Just imagine the first time a combat. Oh no, stab! <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll be, you're a little more durable than that. Unless you get a critical fail, I guess. Yeah. But uh, then for those listening at home, I have good news for you too, John. It means your one point of fortune will be back next time. Yes. So for those <laughs> listening at home, thank you so much for joining us for our first part of the Rough Night at Three Feathers adventure. Uh, as is always the case, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns regarding the session, the campaign, or the game we're playing, please don't hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section down below, and I'll endeavor to reply in a timely fashion. There is also a link in the description of the video to the Dungeon Musings Discord server where all of us are active and we have a channel there dedicated to Warhammer games, both 40k and fantasy varieties, uh, and Soulbound for that matter. I haven't run Soulbound yet, but um, I do have that on my to-do list for this year. Excuse me. Um, there is, um, in addition to that, there's a ton of other great channels over there, like Finding a Group, like GM Discussion, like Virtual Tabletop Advice, tons of great people over there. You are more than welcome to join the community over there. There is also a link down below to something or to uh, our friends at Noble Knight Games. Noble Knight Games is the preeminent unionized retailer of hard to find and out of print RPGs in North America. Not only do they have a terrific selection of new RPGs, board games, and card games, they have an unmatched selection of hard to find and out of print RPGs, uh, including I filled my uh, Warhammer Fantasy 2nd Edition collection with, uh, with their help. Um, they have a terrific feature called the uh, want list. Uh, so if they, have, uh, if they have something listed that isn't in stock, you can put it on the want list. And then when it comes in, you will get an email and you can pick it up. And if you make a purchase of $10 or more through their website, be sure to enter the discount code SPRINGMUSER all one word, all caps, at checkout, and you will save yourself 10% on your purchase. Um, there is also a um, link down below to something called Heroes Save Villages. That is the charity fundraising campaign we run on the channel. It benefits the SOS Children's Villages International Charity, a really amazing organization active in over 130 countries, benefiting over 80,000 orphaned and abandoned children, including ongoing relief efforts in Ukraine and the surrounding countries at the time of recording. Um, all donations that go through that link go directly to SOS Children's Villages International. None of it comes to the channel or any other middleman. It just goes to help out the kids who benefit from their services. 
And as a small way of saying thank you, if you've donated $10 or more since January 1, 2023, you will have an opportunity to vote on our next session in our year-long charity campaign. Our charity campaign, we're playing six sessions over the course of the year. They are linked uh, by story elements, by things, but uh, each session it is donors who are voting on the era we're playing in, the specific time, the types of characters we're playing, the game we're using. We've had two sessions that have been an enormous amount of fun so far. Our next one will be next month in May. So head on over to the, if you have donated $10 or more since January 1st, 2023, head on over to the Dungeon Musing Discord Server's Charity Initiatives channel and cast your vote for the next part of that uh, next session. Uh, if you donate $25 or more, not only do you get a chance to win the grand prize, or to um, vote on our charity sessions. You also get a chance to um, uh, win one of the grand, sorry, the grand prize or one of the other great prizes in our next charity raffle that'll be at the end of June. Uh, the prizes include a chainmail dice bag made by our resident armorsmith, Dave. He has very generously donated another copy of his beautiful uh, chainmail dice bags uh, to the prizes. Uh, there's a, two copies of the D Genesis Rebirth Edition uh, slipcase uh, games. Um, it's a game that's out of print right now, an amazing post-apocalyptic game that is a really unmatched uh, production quality. Uh, there is also an opportunity to play with us. Uh, so there's a couple of great prizes, or a few great prizes, in addition to some other great stuff. Uh, all donations, uh, a chance to vote on the um, charity sessions uh, for this year, and uh, best of all, you get a chance to help out some kids who could really use some help. So a chance to, um, all around, uh, you know, opportunities to uh, be a hero abound. Um, speaking of heroes, last thing I will say is a huge thank you to Darren and John. Guys, this was so much fucking fun running us tonight. This is a really, this is going to be a shit ton of fun playing this game. So thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure. Excellent. So then for those listening at home, we will be back in the old world in two weeks time. But until then, we hope that we gave you a few hours to take your mind off of the troubles of our world and think about the troubles that our heroes are finding in their rough night at the Three Feathers Tavern. And until we see you again, stay safe, stay healthy, and happy gaming.